everyone to What the Force and welcome to our discussion of religion and Star Wars. And with me today is Dr. Sarah Gallant, who is an associate faculty at Everett Community College in Washington State. And she is also working on a religion and speculative fiction anthology. And she's been a longtime friend. I think we're going on at least seven years. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe longer. I'm, I'm not sure. I think I th maybe 10. I, I feel like you've been around a really long time. <laughs> Since, uh, yeah, 2005. Yeah. I oh, think yeah. I in Calgary. Yeah. So, uh, even longer, 13 years. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. This is awesome. So on this podcast, What the Force, we like to talk about kind of really interesting subjects, especially to me. And to me, the the fact that Star Wars really pulls from many world religions out there and is sort of a reflection of the human experience in many ways. I thought it would be really interesting to talk about kind of what those religions are and like how there are maybe, you know, different takes in Star Wars as well as, you know, what those actual religions represent in you know, the real world, right? And where their parallels lie within, say, the force or within um, how people uh, think about things. And if you're interested in kind of the more philosophical aspects of these religions, you can kind of seek them out if you happen to be interested in the lessons that Star Wars is teaching you. Yeah. So I do teach world religions. And um, generally in a world religions class, it's very much of a survey. We kind of just do the basics of, okay, what are the kinds of religions that have kind of made an impact and kind of gone beyond their borders? Um, mm -hmm. So generally any type of world religions course would be a survey of, they probably would cover Buddhism. They would probably cover Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, of course, and Hinduism. And if the instructor has time, they like to add Shinto, indigenous religious traditions, and new religious movements, of course, like Rastafarianism, Scientology, all of the new kind of developments. And um, so I try to give a very kind of balanced, equal, you know, dealing with a lot of different traditions and not dwell too, too much on one, giving one kind of a privileged status. I do a lot of comparison mm -hmm. between different traditions. And um, most of the time we're focusing on certain aspects, like how does ritual appear or what part does it play in everyday practice and tradition or what types of belief system and worldviews are developed within each of these traditions. And of course, you're going to get variety within any different tradition that you look at. So it, there's not going to be one standard understanding of Buddhism or of Hinduism. It's going to be interpreted by many different cultures, many different people. So I'm basically going to try to communicate certain key concepts and ideas that are generally associated with specific traditions. And uh, hopefully those key concepts can kind of we can take those and apply those to Star Wars and help us give a better understanding of, okay, what was Lucas trying to do? Where did he appropriate those ideas from? And what kind of context was he trying to spin them in, in his particular myth of Star Wars? That's, that's awesome. That's exactly what I want. And, and also like the Lucas group has really taken his vision and in many of the, you know, full canon. So the books and the uh, sequel trilogy now has reinforced some ideas of especially the force in new and interesting ways. And I think that they're all in line with what Lucas originally intended, which he was particularly pulling from what he knew, uh, Eastern religions, Western religions, this idea of, you know, finding the, the whole self especially, you know, like the balance of finding who is a complete and full person, because that very much ties into the monomyth and, you know, Joseph Campbell and as you become a, a full and realized adult from adolescence. Oh, okay. So there are many different concepts of the self. Um, my understanding of what Lucas was trying to do, he was so inspired by a Japanese film 
Um, again, I'm not an expert, but he was pulling from Japanese stuff that he saw in those films and the kind of samurai culture. So in Japan, the religious traditions that are most influential are, of course, Shinto that developed within Japan. And of course, Buddhism, Taoism and Confucianism migrate to Japan and from China, of course, mainland China. Mm -hmm. And all of those kind of sort of gel together to contribute to Japanese understanding of the world. So we're going to talk about the self and developing of the self you want to talk about? Okay. Sure. Yeah, let's do that because I think that that's really key into um, this idea of balance that especially has been pulled into the sequel trilogy more, more recently and is the open question of the modern storytelling. Okay, so balance and harmony are both um, definitely concepts that are very, very key to uh, both Shinto and Taoism. So Taoism, of course, has two elements of yin and yang. And every part of the universe and ourselves are made up of these things. They're just complementary processes and forces. Neither one is positive or negative. They're positive and negative in the sense that they're electrons and protons. They're different forces that attract and respond mm -hmm. to each other. So these are forces that we need to be mindful of and aware of and kind of, uh, yeah, modify our behavior and our understanding in Taoism as a way to kind of go with the flow of those forces. Mm -hmm. So Confucianism, in contrast, would be one has to, according to Confucius, try very, very hard to become uh, an established, um, responsible junzi noble person gentleman is sometimes the translation used mm -hmm. so social focus would be what confucian is um you're cultivating virtues that are like virtues that are very much uh in line with culture train yourself to be familiar with the classics and all of the proper conduct and etiquette because social discord you know tian or disharmony heaven's way gets disrupted if you're not operating um, according to those very specific guidelines. In contrast, Taoism is not going to be so strict. It's going to be, let's look at the processes of nature and model our behavior after those. So yin and yang, those forces that are unfolding processes like the ebb and flow of the tides or the crashing of water and um, the stillness of water. All of those different aspects can be encompassed in um, natural processes. So the model for our human beings and human development is to not try so hard, is to, mm. you know, cultivate effortlessness, which is Wu Wei. That's the concept. So if you're trying too hard, you're obviously pushing against the tide. You're not being in tune with um, what you should be. So you just create discord and strife simply by not going with the flow. And qi or qi is very much um, the force in, in many different interpretations. So it's that underlying kind of flow that all things kind of have. So within Taoism, um, there's this um, internal alchemy process that gets interpreted. So I think very much Star Wars is about addressing, like, how can we become superhuman you know, figures? How can we improve ourselves and eventually, possibly, cultivate these uh, amazing feats, miraculous feats? So Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu, is basically a legendary mythological figure who's associated mm -hmm. with the Tao Te Ching. It's his teachings that become the Tao Te Ching, like this, the way of, mm -hmm. yeah, the Tao. And so all of these processes are have one original source, um, and the two, the yin and yang, originate from that one source. And all of the multitudes of other things that we encounter also originate from one underlying source. What is that source? Oh, the Tao. Oh. Uh, but the, the Tao is described in very poetic terms. It's hard to understand or to really understand other than to describe it in metaphors. And the metaphors that they use are natural processes, water, femininity, um, the darkness, stillness. So it's... Oh, so I have I have a Star Wars example that might blow your mind, which is in in a recent um, junior novelization, there was a a frame story. So this is the Legends of Luke Skywalker. 
And in that story, there was a story called Fishing in the Deluge. And this group on this planet believed that the force was actually called the tide. Okay. Because it goes in and out and it is, it just exists. It is the tide and you can't go against the tide. You have to go with what the tide wants of you and how it wants to behave. And in the end, there is a combination that needs to happen, which is you go with the tide, but sometimes you need to do what is right. Which is, it's just a really interesting concept. And the fact that they're exploring it in a junior novelization to explain this concept of yin and yang and Taoism in 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 a way that, you know, a 10 or an 11 year old could understand is just so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that does seem to be like resonating with those kinds of ideas. And of course... Um, the natural processes in the natural world, that's not unique to Taoism. That's kind of an ancient Chinese kind of pre-Taoistic kind of idea. So that there are natural processes in the world that need to be observed and maintained, um, or rather abided by. Because human beings, um, yeah, bad things happen when you try to, you know, push against the tide as it were. Yeah, yeah. You like when just you waste when effort and energy and you build a dock in the tide, the tide will eventually take out the dock, right? Yep, definitely. Um I'm also thinking about um since we're talking specifically about the inspiration coming from Japan, I want to kind of note that Shinto also has all of these other underlying forces, but there are beings and spirits and kami and ancestors that need to be abided by so it's kind of like it's not like this inert world there are living forces and living creatures in all types of different forms those that we can see and not see um, that also need to be maintained right relations with so i'm not really sure what the type of um, otherworldly creatures would be in star wars that i i know i'm recalling from my childhood when obi-wan just completely disappears and his the robe force. falls to the he he dissolves into the force, but yet his voice is still resonating. His voice is still heard in other places. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's a complete like emptiness at, or leaving him. Like he's still somehow engaging with the world. And there's this uh this new this concept, and it's been around since the prequels of the living force, which very much describes what you were just saying, this idea of the flow, the tide, and from that living force, this in and out, this life and death, this growth and rebirth idea, comes the cosmic force, which is the will, the the decision making of the universe. And they call it they call it the cosmic force. The cosmic force. So that sounds very similar to me, like the concept of Tian or heaven or heaven's way, which pre, you know, is one of those underlying mm -hmm. concepts that um, Taoism and Confucianism developed out of. So the Tao for Confucius was heaven's way. It wasn't just the way. It was like this um, impersonal almost force or way that things should be mm -hmm. that kind of you wanted to not go against so heaven's way heaven's mandate if things were properly flowing in the world or things were as they should be there was a proper structure to things and a proper order to things and the right person was emperor and the right nobleman people were noble persons so if people weren't acting according to confucius the way they should be according to their duties and responsibilities then heaven's way was not being maintained so that there would be you know an overflow a revolution an upset and then new people would come forward that were more in line with heaven's way. So Tian is that concept. Um, yeah. I don't know if that sort of resonates with what you were getting at or like what they've been pulling out, especially in the novelizations is that these chosen people that are almost like avatars of the force in the world, like, like Anakin, like Ray and like Kylo are these instruments of the force. They're described that way. Would you call them manifestations or um, avatars? I think that Anakin has been, I mean, not significantly proven, but he was born from the Force as far as we know. What Qui-Gon said, right? He was a creation of the Force. Okay. Right? So there's, 
two types of self and concepts I'd like to present then. One from Hinduism and one from Buddhism. So in Hinduism, or in many um, rather Hindu thoughts, uh, there's different Samkhya thought and there's also Advaita Vedantin. So the self, the Atman in Hinduism, doesn't change. It just takes on different forms from lifetime to lifetime. And uh, according to the concept of Leela, it's just what happens. There's this, you know, cycle of play taking on these many forms. So different incarnations of gods, um, such as various forms of Vishnu or Shiva, could come into the world and kind of present uh, models for being. So Krishna, for example, Ram, for example. Um, so those would be avatars. Those would be representations of that particular deity. But within Buddhism, we don't really have um, the same concept of self. Um, it's an Atman, no self. There's no distinct personality or individual that doesn't change from lifetime to lifetime. So it's a little bit more of a difficult concept because yes, there are personalities and aspects and features of each individual, but it's more in line with your karma, those consequences that get kind of bogged down with the self that mm. create this new self that comes into being. So within Buddhism, there's also a branch of Buddhism that's Mahayana Buddhism. And in Mahayana Buddhism, there are figures called bodhisattvas that enter back into the cycle of samsara once they have achieved enlightenment in order to help other beings and creatures, you know, achieve enlightenment and get past all the messy suffering of life. So a bodhisattva would um, be a compassionate being that has already had this understanding of the world and um, of reality and wants to bring that to others. And they're motivated by compassion to re-enter this cycle. So within Tibetan Buddhism, there's this emphasis on both uh, masculine and feminine bodhisattvas. Tara would be the feminine, um, mm. Avalokiteshvara. So of course the Dalai Lama is understood in Tibetan Buddhism to be one of these emanations of Avalokiteshvara, this compassionate, being coming back into the world. Um, and Tara is understood to be the mother of all Buddhas in Tibetan Buddhism. She is also compassionate, um, trying to, she took the vow, according to legend, to continue to help others, even after all beings have achieved enlightenment, that she would continue to relieve suffering. So there's this devotional tradition that develops around the Bodhisattvas. Pure Land Buddhism in China and Tibet, it, there's this idea that if you devote through puja, through devotion, um, showing devotion to Amitabha Buddha, you can be reborn in the pure land. This is the realm of Amitabha Buddha. And you can achieve enlightenment after death in the pure land. So you don't have to go back in. It's kind of you get taken under his care. So there's devotional practices to these bodhisattvas. I know I'm probably getting a bit off topic, but it's okay. the concept of a bodhisattva, a compassionate being, coming back into the world to help others might be something that um, might apply. <laughs> I don't know. In some cases, that's, that's really the interesting. Star Wars franchise. Yeah, no, I think it does. I, sorry. No, no, I think it does. So do you remember in The Last Jedi when Rey walks into the cave? Mm, yes. I and she touches the, the mirror cave wall and she has that image of her herself into infinity. That's very much in line with some of the bodhisattva imagery of the bodhisattva, the regeneration cycle, the, the coming back, the uh, reincarnation cycle that she goes through. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, uh, the Lotus Sutra is um, one of the uh, classic Mahayana texts that talks about there's being this infinite line of Buddhas going back indefinitely in time and forward in time, always being present, or ready, rather bodhisattvas coming back to help others, or rather be present in the world and take part in, yeah, bringing compassion and bringing things together. Uh, of course, I'm muddying the waters by throwing some Confucian yeah. ideas there. But in China... The three doctrines are very much blend together. So the three doctrines are, of course, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism. So it's kind of like those blending things, ideas happen all the time for people in their religious lives and they're in China specifically. Yeah, and it feels like Star Wars is not the Earth, but it is a reflection of all that is 
that is in culture in the earth. In many ways, they cherry pick these ideas that um, help people find truth um, in themselves and bring them forward in a storytelling narrative. And so this this could very well mean that. And so, so what I've heard some people say is that this means that reincarnation could exist in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that being a, an interpretation supported by the sources, as Recur would say. So you could both use that as perhaps Ray is a bodhisattva mm -hmm. or rather an incarnation of some kind of deity um, if we're looking at the Hindu understanding. But Ray doesn't appear to be very aware of her nature in that case, or rather she's becoming more aware. She grows in her training. Nature of the self and the nature of, yeah. The cosmos, right? Like in, yeah. Like in 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 the Last Jedi novelization, um, at the end of the throne room fight, when she is, you know, her, she wakes up and she sees Kylo laying there. They, they actually describe this scene. She leaves Kylo alone. Uh, she realized that she was an instrument of the Force, and she looks at Kylo and says, "Luke's mistake was thinking his his decision had already been made, and her mistake was thinking that his decision." was easy and that the force wasn't done with him yet he was still an instrument of the force so she was trying to see uh redemption or possibilities for kylo yes and she i think that that's like a big theme that we do see within the arc in that it follows very much a redemption storyline narrative. And also there's all these big clues that are that are saying like he's still being drawn towards the light. He makes the right decision in the right moment to kill Snoke, but then kind of goes back. And that's very much with the up and down play of a narrative to say that he's going towards more of a center role, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Taoist um, thought definitely cautions or rather says stray away from binaries. Not everything is completely white, black, you know, good, bad. There's always a blending of the two. So there's always an aspect of light and dark, like in the visual representation of the yin yang symbol. There's always an element of the white and the dark. There's an element of the dark and the light. And those things are just kind of unfolding. So no matter how many times things unfold, they could swing pendulum one way back to the other. So I think in that sense, Ray would be correct. There's always potential. There's always potential for, you know, self-improvement. There's always potential for to do the right thing, as Confucius would illustrate, or rather reiterate and stress. Um, yeah, doing the right thing. I think the ethical aspect of Star Wars, um, doing the right thing because it's hard, you know, it's for the mm -hmm. doing the right thing that... You might, you do it because you don't, not because you're going to get praised or because you're going to avoid punishment, but you do it because it's right. And that particular understanding is karma yoga. And it's uh, presented in the Bhagavad Gita by Krishna to Arjuna. So act in a way, not so that you're going to um, reap the fruits of your labor and not because you're afraid, but do your duty because that's what you're supposed to do. That's how you act in accordance with, well, according to the Hindu worldview, what's expected of you according to your station, your caste, according to your lot in life and your responsibilities to your family and your greater community. So karma yoga, um, that's um, one of the types of ethical paths or rather ways of acting that's presented in a classical text. And that's, um, of course, yeah, uh, Brahmanic. Yeah, that's Hindu. So that would be from India. Mm -hmm. uh, but like the in and out of the tide and the yin yang is very much in balance with that idea in that you acknowledge that there is this like ever changing, ever present, you know, change to the world that you live in, but that you try your best to fulfill your role within within the world and within the galaxy the far, far away. Yeah, definitely. In that sense, yeah, very Taoist, not mm -hmm. necessarily Confucian. Um, Confucian would be much more concerned with social etiquette and immediate concerns 
of are you doing the right thing in the right context to, for your family, for society, and uh, you know, in it by extension, peace and prosperity will come about if everybody's acting in accordance with how they should be. Um, but in Taoism, it's much more broad and idealistic and open to interpretation. There's not these hard and fast rules. You have to, you know, cultivate an understanding and act in accordance with what the processes are the way, you mm. know, call for at that moment. And it takes continuous thoughtfulness and improvement. Yeah. Thoughtfulness and effort. I mean, I think I think just like because because like that's always that's always been like the Jedi way. It's like you have to always be on the path. But is it more that you just give yourself over to the way, right? And the way will lead you, or is it more that you need to be thoughtfulness? And it what I what I really see is that there's a shift in from what the Jedi in the say prequel trilogy represented, which is like, no, you must be good. As a good person, you will not hate. You will not be greedy. You will not be angry. To more of a, you know, if you follow the way, the way will lead you plugged into like the undercurrent of the cosmic force. That's honestly what's happening in the shift. It's going from like a Confucius perspective to a Taoist perspective. And um, along with that, I just posted a link into the chat if you can check that out. Oh, into the chat. Mm -hmm. So this is the image of um, a yoga type person, a yogi type person um, image that was in the pool in the Jedi temple on Octo where Ray and Luke were having conversations about the Jedi. Oh, that it's a mosaic. Is this yeah. what you're uh, referring Yeah. So this was a mosaic that's in that was in the Jedi temple and it's filled with water and Luke and Ray are speaking on the edge of this pool and she is sitting on the quote unquote light side with the dark circle. Mm. Circle, right? So you've also got some of a human figure divided down the middle in it. And part of the human figure is, you know, darker figure out, you know, highlighted in white and a white figure highlighted in dark. Um, if this is, oh, I hope I can make it bigger. No. Oh, well. So there's definitely a strong division in this symbol. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, the classic yin yang symbol has more of a, a wavy division between mm -hmm. the two sides um, so there's a, a definite straight split and a straight line is not common to Taoist architecture and garden. <laughs> it's off on its own, but I want to, I want to use one quote, which, um, Ryan Johnson described Kylo and Ray as two halves of the same protagonist. Oh, two halves of the same protagonist. So yes. they're complementary. They're feminine and masculine. Yeah. S force and subtlety and... Yeah. Yeah. So, well, there's a tr troubling or somehow sometimes problematic concept within um, gender understandings called complementarianism that men and women are two halves of the same whole and they are different um, fundamentally in their essences. And that um, by coming together, there's this this cosmic kind of joining that there's a wholeness made. And that kind of mystical union is. Um, well, part of a theme in Tantric Buddhism, as well as Kabbalah. Um, so it's a joining of the male and the female. And um, probably, well, when you take that to its logical step, if you assert that men have essential natures and women have essential natures, then we have <laughs> problems that, um, yeah, translate into, wait, wait, not all men are burly lumberjacks and not all women are, you know, fainting damsels. So the, the essentialization of these natures, um, I think they should be understood in more abstract terms rather yeah. than ideals to strive towards. No, you're right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, we see very much um, some like we see a lot of emotion on Kylo's face during The Last Jedi in that he is upset. He is torn. He is um, kind of at some points he looks like on the edge of tears, you know, like he's he's really expressing some sensitivities that I would say were maybe not expected by a lot of people. 
Yeah, he's definitely not a stoic, unattached, um, emotionless, you know, classic Jedi that we yeah. think of when we think of Obi-Wan or even the jolly Yoda, you know, he's kind of yeah. like laughing at things, which is more like Zhang Zi, um, the laughing sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Rey is very strong and physically powerful, right? Which is also kind of unexpected. And both of them together are very powerful people. And it's like, what is what is the the yin and y- the yang of that? Is it just the feminine and the masculine? Is it that together they can sort of find some sort of balance together? It seems like that's what they're heading towards from a story perspective. And it's interesting that they are sort of calling on these different aspects. I think it's really interesting that, yes, if those two characters are presenting are are, you know, presenting different archetypes, then Kylo is more emotional and volatile. Like we generally associate mm-hmm. with hysterical women. Um, and <laughs> Ray is being more grounded and duty bound. And, you know. Yeah. Like she's got to help her friends and she's got to be there for people. And she's got to bring Luke back because Leia needs him. And yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely think like they're, they're, they're foil characters. Definitely. One is bringing out aspects of the other. And what's really interesting, what I loved about the last Jedi movie was that when the two of them are having this very intimate conversation that only they can be part of, like they are connected. Mm -hmm. Well, they are able to speak across long distances and have intimate conversations. And then one reaches out to touch the other. There's this desire to touch and have a connection, this hepatic kind of need to comfort and Mm -hmm. to, to be in the presence to be really connected um, to this other, this desire to be seen, to be heard. And, you know, I, we could take a very classic, oh, it's just a romantic trope. They're, tr- they're you know, increasing sexual tension. But no, actually, I think there's a very human desire also being, you know, articulated there. This want to be, you know, in the presence and be present and be connected in a very physical way, as well as understood and on the same page with Mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily like-minded individuals, but, you know, being, yeah. You know, when you're a teenager and you're like, oh, this person really gets me. Yeah. Yeah. You have that moment where you're like, oh, finally, someone, you know, speaks my language. Someone like knows what, how hard life is, you know, (laughs) there's, there's definitely an adolescence, a, a stage of, you know, development that's being highlighted in this, second movie of this so it's like they're both cross they're both you know on their journeys they're both you know struggling to figure out their place and yeah and they're on different paths they're on different you know contexts circumstances different places in the galaxy at that moment yeah desire to reach out and touch this desire to be you know understood i think is very well really it resonated with me it spoke to me i'm like oh yeah that's exactly what you know people need in that very liminal stage of your life you know when you're in this process of becoming when you're on your way to become something that you're supposed to be whether that be an adult in society or perhaps realizing your destiny in a greater cosmic kind of framework yeah you're in an adolescent period you're in that liminal stage there's a rite of passage happening what does liminal mean i i apologize i don't know what that means (laughs) Sorry, um, in ritual studies, like Victor Turner, Ron Grimes, Catherine Bell, there's um, some anthropologists have talked about communities when they are, you know, identifying life, you know, stages of life, like birth, death, you know, marrying, burying, Mm -hmm. the classic points where you change your status in the community, like you become, pass from childhood to adulthood, or when you pass from singleton to married spouse now you are someone to someone so when you change your status in a community there's this rite of passage that you enter into and that's often um, associated with rites of passage like adolescence like a bar mitzvah for example you are now going to be seen as an adult in that particular community Mm -hmm. so there are parts or times when every individual is not necessarily in a very um succinct or identifiable category or place in the community so when you're in between stages or you're in between um points in your life where you're not quite a child and you're not quite an adult and people don't know what to do with you 
or you're not, you're kind of on the outskirts. You're not quite an insider and you're not quite an outsider. Those are liminal states when you're in a liminal in betwixt and between. And you have to enter into those liminal states in order to progress, in order to become something else. So you shed one status for another. So it's the in-between stages. And there's, you know, scariness that happens because your identity is no longer a given and you're trying to find it, find the new one, find out who you are. Yeah. That's that's really wonderful that you stated that way, because in many ways, Ray and Kylo in the sequel trilogy are outsiders in the adopted communities that they have been adopted into ray into this resistance and kylo into the first order he was adopted into the first order and ray was adopted into the resistance oh yes okay yeah oh man i really really like adoption stories like moses in the basket in the river and you know Mm -hmm. like where you kind of come from another place and you have another understanding and then you speak to the community or you rather are trying to find your place in the community. So um, often in the uh, the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, so the prophets are like called voices in the wilderness because they um, chastise or rather they hearken the community to tell God doesn't want you to do this stuff. If you don't change your ways, blah. So there's a, There's kind of this acknowledgement of like insight and perspective coming from the outside as having some real revelatory um, aspect to it that change can be, or rather an outsider's perspective can be um, beneficial to things that have kind of become stagnant within a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like Snoke himself views the First Order as almost like he took it over opportunistically. And, you know, Kylo is this almost like... In in a way, like Moses uh, being raised by Pharaoh, you know, in a way, like he's got that feel like he was he was adopted and pulled from his family. But really, like his family is elsewhere and his family is, you know, on the quote unquote good side of <laughs> of the story, whereas Pharaoh is on the bad side and he was adopted and. Um, you know, Moses was, even though he kind of participated in all of the Egyptian pharaoh's wills, he ended up finding the truth in the wilderness and becoming the true person he was meant to be back with his people. So forest renouncers, yeah, people going off into the wilderness to find spiritual or rather more um, a better understanding of the fundamental questions of life, the Buddha. Um, went off into, you know, the wilderness rather to practice asceticism. And it was only through meditation under the Bodhi tree that he realized um, nirvana. But yeah, forest renouncers, the last stage of, uh, yeah, the Hindu life cycle. There's a long tradition of ascetics and renouncers, like holy men, holy women going off, um, you know, cutting ties with all of the familiar you know, family obligations and stuff. Very much what Luke did, you know? Uh, do you mean when he went to go study with Yoda or when he went with... Oh, no, in the new movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. When he cut ties not only with the Force, but with Leia and with everybody that needed him in the whole universe because he felt like he was... That was not the way. He he had gotten distracted, yeah. He had... um He needed to, yeah, quiet everything to kind of... Mm-hmm distance himself yeah so forest renouncers but renunciation is definitely one method of you know seeking Mm -hmm. going into figure out you know the fundamentals of life and that kind of thing um and Taoist monks do that all the time yeah um that's what they were kind of known for Taoist monasteries and temples weren't built until buddhism came on the scene in china and then you know prompting the question oh where are your guys's texts where are your temples well that's what Oh, I guess we better build some. So that's, it's a later development, Taoist temples and Taoist um, scriptures and Taoist texts, um, Mm -hmm. because it was a response to Buddhism. So yeah, going off to be secluded in the wilderness, surrounded by the example of nature is very... And Yoda in the original trilogy, right? Oh, yeah. uh, See, he was out... In Dagobah. Okay, Dagobah. Yeah. I'm now recalling with fondness, um, yeah, Weird Al's song. (laughs) <laughs> Yoda. <laughs> yes. And the others. Um, okay. So I guess we've touched on the self. 
We've touched a little bit on ethics and being in right relations with the world. We've touched on feminine and masculine, different aspects of the world, Mm -hmm. ritual aspects, daily practice, the Jedi Order and the lay person. I don't know if that's so much a focus in the films, the uh, ritual practice. I mean, Jedis would have very strict guidelines and practices in order to assist them in their training. But um, but have they moved away from that? Perhaps. In Zen, in Zen Buddhism, um, seated meditation is becomes the emphasis. Meditation becomes the central practice. And that's not necessarily um, ritualistic, um, but it is more of a... A ritual in the sense that it is a daily practice or habitual action. Um, so rather than structured, formal devotional practices or sacrifices, yeah, seated meditation seems to be uh, a feature. If what I'm understanding from watching Luke when he sits down. Yeah. But but also like even Vader, because um, he was known to have meditation um, even as Darth Vader in his um, chamber, his hyperbolic tra- chamber, he was known to be meditating. Oh, um, sorry. Um, forgive my ignorance. When was Vader in the hyper? But like when he was being, when he was recovering from injuries. In Empire Strikes Back, one of the captains come in and he's been in the chamber, and it's become canon that he. Um, Like in the comics, for example, that he uses that as time to kind of process. And um, it's it's very funny because in the comics, they actually show him with these phantom limbs as he's meditating. And it's very um, sort of Avatar, the last airbender, like he's seated and he is uh, in this world of chaos and he's just like a, a burnt soul with these phantom limbs. It's really it's really fascinating to see some of the imagery. Yeah, I think that's a classic um, trope that when you damage one part of your body, you somehow are able to reach out um, with other parts. Like, you know, Daredevil, he's blind, but he's able to have these super senses. And when the body becomes um, not necessarily your main focus anymore, your mind becomes that much more of a, you know, flexing limb. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, jump in with the idea of kundalini yoga what what is that (laughs) um so i mentioned earlier karma yoga the the um duty action karma that you're cultivating and and by yoga you don't mean like the practice of doing downward dog oh that would be hatha yoga so there are different (laughs) yogas there's different developments and and what does yoga mean on a base honestly Mm. just uh it's it's a Sanskrit term and it really means just discipline or yoke or path. So there are different yogic paths. I mean, the majority of Hindus are bhakti yoga practitioners. They um, engage in devotional rituals with a particular deity. Um, so, you know, presenting a particular figure, um, being seen by the figure with light and incense and food and that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. there's also meditational yoga um, and then, develop and sometimes meditational yoga gets combined with those physical practices so a combination of the royal yoga which is breath and meditation raja yoga and kundalini yoga is something that comes up it's articulated in avatar the last airbender opening up those chakras it's perceived as like bringing the whole body in line and awakening into this kind of blissful state and under bigger understanding um I'm not sure if that's what's being hinted at in some of those um, scenes in. Like with Ray meditating on the, like on the, on the rock or, or, you know, just um, Yoda telling Luke, like even in Emperor Strikes Back, you know, you will know the force when you are at peace and when you are calm. Hmm. I think that's, yeah, seems more Taoist to me, honestly, now now that I think about it. Just being in, in line or in, in accordance with everything around you, knowing, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a stillness and an emptiness and that that's kind of given this positive quality in, uh, in Taoist art and thought. So definitely much, very much in line with Taoism. Yeah, they that's repeated like several times 
in not just the original trilogy and how Yoda talks about the Force, but also very much in the sequel trilogy in that when you empty yourself, you are able to be filled with the Force. That I want to think a little bit more about because if you are making yourself empty to be filled up as a vessel, that assumes that there is um, some greater, more forceful or more potent thing that you can tap into. Mm -hmm. um, I like, think that would be internal alchemy um, happening. And, yeah. And they've tied it to like hmm, in Clone Wars with these and in Rebels with these small children who literally don't have, you know, consciousness or thought that's clouding up their minds and they're able to use the force just as well as adults because it's more of a, a reflex it's more yeah. of a natural instinct rather than yeah being bogged down with all the you know contraptions and baggage of worldviews imposed on you and the jedi the jedi of the past are only able to get there through a rigorous practice and ritual whereas the jedi Luke, Yoda, Ray, in you know original trilogy and on, are are able to have the ally in the Force, right? When they open themselves up and they are calm, like almost quoting Yoda, you know, a powerful ally it is. That assumes that whatever happens, you're okay with. Yeah, you yeah. kind of you've kind of extinguished your own will. So that is definitely Buddhist in the sense that there's a, a cultivation of non-attachment. It's like you are recognizing that suffering happens and good things happen and change is inevitable. So yeah, yeah, you're become you know, you're becoming more detached and okay with things that as they unfold. One thing that uh, was called out in the sequel trilogy, and I think this is the first time I've heard it actually called this uh, Luke calls the Jedi a religion. So the word religion is Western. Um, mm -hmm. And it's religio, it's Latin to bind. So it can indicate that you're binding communities, you're binding gods to human beings. So because he calls himself the last of the Jedi religion. So it sounds like if, you know, assuming that if we associate the word religion in the West with organized, like we often do in orthodoxy and uh, mm -hmm. orthopraxy, right practice, right doctrine, um, it sounds like Luke is trying to push for a less structured or a less um, imposed sort of form of, yeah. yeah. So this way is no longer beneficial. That would Yeah. Like the, the idea that, um, and, and those are, those are to his lessons that he actually tries to teach Rey in in the last Jedi like you know the Jedi don't own the light and you know the Jedi were religion was hubris to say that they that their way was the only way right and, and then if you strayed from the path then bad things happen and you're overtaken yeah. you can't but, handle it on your own but interestingly enough like in the deleted scenes and in the book we actually get the third um his like weird twisted version of those rules which was the jedi's way was in action like in action like no action yeah effortlessness Wu way yeah yeah but he's saying that that's not right that you have to take action you have to be the force of change in the galaxy okay so there's more of an active but you can't go again you can't use it for self selfish reasons it has to be selfless but action yeah i i would definitely associate that with duty um mm -hmm. dharma in the hindu sense dharma means teaching in buddhism the dharma of the buddha and dharma is duty in the Bhagavad gita so act karma act do act according according to krishna it's like don't even if you know you don't want to do what's necessary even if it means fighting and causing suffering you can't just remain inert inactive you must act in accordance with your dharma your duty there's also um this really interesting idea that the jedi um you know try to be selfless but let's just go more generically to the light and the dark right and dark force users people that use the dark side of the force or rely on that use it because they want 
they want, right? They, they, they want to use the force to do things. They want to control it and manipulate it and do it, make it do things that they need and want. Whereas people on the light side, let the force use them for the selfless things that they need to have happen. So it sounds like, in a sense, if according to the dark side, they are using the force as an instrument in order to achieve their desires and gains. Yes. And the light side is seeing themselves as the instrument of the force. So it's like active, inactive. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, in Buddhism, we, the Four Noble Truths, we suffer because we desire um, we desire things that are familiar, things that we want, all of those base desires, all of those lofty desires. And in order to stop suffering, you become desireless, create non-attachment, you know, recognize that things change and everything is going to change. So if you cling to things that you want and are always dissatisfied, you have to cultivate the sense of non-attachment. And that's when Noble Eightfold Path is presented by the Buddha. So, yeah, desire and attachment and, you know, will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely bound up. So creating suffering. I mean, yeah, but uh, but like that's all tied to what the Jedi did in the past, right? Like they said non-attachment is the way, but it, it still caused a Darth Vader. And what saved Vader was the attachment to Luke. Oh, was love, compassion. Yeah. Compassion and love. Yeah, and seeing... Yeah, um, I wish I was more oh. versed in the later Confucian. Um, There's also this idea that um, Star Wars is also all about family. You know, always, right? It's always about some sort of aspect of family, finding family, finding acceptance within a community, a place, right? Your own family or others, right? Making family. Um there's just this really interesting idea out there because like the the first um, three movies have all been about family. The the original trilogy, <laughs> right? The the Skywalkers. <laughs> I read in an early draft of the script that it wasn't Luke Skywalker. It was Sky Killer. Um, Star Killer. Yeah. Star Killer. Yeah. But Skywalker became the later, you know rendition um so yeah family sagas those are part of the stories that we really like like the epics the you know following the generations of how people become people and what the um legacy that they pass on to each other um so legacy and honoring what the teachings that have come down to you that would be confusion but the non-attachment um there's almost like an emphasis on finding family for people that are, you know, going to support you in your endeavors. So leaving perhaps your dysfunctional family or your family that doesn't understand you for an adoptive family, perhaps a monastic one, an, an order, um, mm -hmm. in order to assist you in becoming who you need to be. But I, but I think that where the Jedi went wrong, at least in, you know, the old Republic, as it were, in the Republic was that they took they they took that choice away from people right it wasn't their choice to go and join the jedi order because they took them as small children oh so cultivating the best and the brightest and then creating super soldiers creating yeah know, yeah entitled like van vanity entitling yeah. you know so and then creating of course um class systems um of, if you're training the brahmins if you're training the people that are you know of a higher born or a more advantageous and liberal are free existence. People that are able to use the force, people that mm -hmm. have this ability. So they happen to be lucky enough to be born in this form that has given them options to explore, you know? So they're, they're the Brahmins, they're the upper class. So the vanity that gets associated with being in, you know, a prestigious role, a prestigious kind of station. Um, yeah. The, the dangers that can happen yeah and i think what's i think i think that's really interesting because part of what luke is i think trying to say is that everyone has the force right just some people have it you know have the have the option more easily at their fingertips right just some people just have it there whereas some people actually need to 
work through their own things that are standing in 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 the way of getting to the way. Yeah. Um yeah, definitely. I would I would think especially given the last scene in the last Jedi yeah. that it becomes much more obvious that many different people in many walks of life are you know, connected to this ability, but they haven't been acknowledged or it hasn't been. It seems like it's a, it's a path for the few, the pa- proud, the brave, you know, the Bodhisattva path. It's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, but Bodhisattvas are motivated by compassion. Um, they are to work for others to the lesser suffering. If a Jedi is a Bodhisattva or someone working towards the Bodhisattva path. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just so fascinating. I I love talking about this. <laughs> well, hopefully I haven't thrown too many uh wonky words. Oh, no, no, no. It's interesting. And and I mean, certainly like if any of this interests people that are listening, like look it up. It's really interesting to think about, hey, these these ideas are the ideas of our own human condition, our own cultures, right, that exist in this world. And they've been thought about for, you know, a really long time, thousands of years. They percolate and resonate within cultures and then take up a certain form in fiction and film. Absolutely. So it's like, in, in its purest sense, it's been something that has already existed within, you know, Asian, East, you know, Asian culture, et cetera, Eastern culture. Yeah. Um, and to throw some French philosophy in there, um, intertextuality, nothing exists in a vacuum. There's always references to all kinds of previous existing literature, previous existing thoughts and concepts. So you can't really think of one particular text or film in isolation. Um, yeah, these things kind of enrich the understanding of like, okay, where is that being appropriated from? What is, you know, the idea that's trying to be articulated and how is it taking on this form? What's, what's the particular, um, understanding of Tao or Chi or the force that's being presented here? Um, not to say that there's one correct one. Um, but of course, Lucas has his own understanding of what he's taking from other cultures, what he's putting his twist on so he's appropriating and creating that's definitely part of the creative process and also like you know now there's new creators since the sale to disney um and lucasfilm right so like so i mean very much the lucas story group has said the vision of the force has not changed since lucas was in control so i'm wondering if somewhere there's like lucas's thoughts on the force are like you know almost engraved engraved on the wall right and each storyteller gets to be paraded past the wall (laughs) and be like okay this is what the force is this is how it works Hmm. so is there a uh a sacred document or text against which everything is well um that's really that's really interesting because although this hasn't officially um you know come out in the force awakens novelization I'm going to actually pull the quote up and say it. Okay. Yeah. So there is in the, in the force awakens novelization at the start, kind of the prologue, there was this, this sort of poem and it was called, it was from something called the journal of the wills, which um, Lucas has referred to the temple of the wills was in rogue one where they got all the Kyber crystal from. It's this idea that this thing this this uh, it's we're not 100 percent sure what it exactly means other than we know it was in the force awakens the the temple of the wills yeah and and this journal of the wills tbd what it exactly means but i'll say the quote from the force awakens novelization first comes the day then comes the night After the darkness shines through the light, the difference, they say, is only made right by resolving of gray through refined Jedi sight. Oh, refined sight. Specifically Jedi sight. (laughs) Jedi sight, being able to see. So that could be um, right understanding, um, part of the Buddhist understanding of being able to uh, see clearly everything in accordance or it could be um 
you know, a certain sensory power that's achieved through eternal alchemy in Taoism. Um, but I, I really want to think more about that. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. So first comes the day, then comes the night. Because the Tao Te Ching talks about night and day having one, you know, originating source. They're just two sides of the same coin. But making things right in accordance, like creating proper order to things, that would be something Confucian would be, you know, Confucius mm -hmm. would be emphasizing. So maybe perhaps the Jedi are the noble people, the Junzi, those people that try really hard to, you know, put order to things, make sure things are as they should be to create a sense of peace and prosperity around them. Peace and purpose. <laughs> yeah, that could yeah. be it too. Yeah. And like, it's really interesting, though, that like, the, the Empire and the First Order, which is like born from the Empire, very much describe what they try to achieve as bringing order to the galaxy. And they view what the resistance and the rest of the population, the other side as chaos and like, disorder. So it's like, this is the way things should be. Um, well, it uh, just a piece of trivia. Both uh, Confucian and Taoist thought uh, per were basically created during the Warring States period in China. So chaos and disorder was something that both of these responses were kind of generated toward. So that's where Confucianism and Taoism developed out of was responses to the Warring State period. Like, how do you... Um, well, there's an idealization. How do we get back to the good old days, the golden age, according to Confucius, when things were as they should be? Well, Confucius says we need to really mind our manners and be mindful of how we, um, yeah, live up to our responsibility to other human beings. And Taoist says, no, we need to really be more, um, model ourselves after nature, go with the flow. So these are two responses to how to, you know, address chaos and disorder and in the world. Mm -hmm. And they are very, maybe perhaps Confucian thought um, can, there can be elements definitely within Jedi and, you know, to I their mean, extreme in the dark side. Yeah, I would say that, like, it's the Jedi were all about order. And, and as the Empire took over, it was the legacy of how the Jedi organized the clone troopers that produced the empire to be as orderly as it was. So it's like Confucianism gone wrong. So, uh, so that there's no room for um, humanity of, you know, the humanness, mm -hmm. there's no compassion. There's just only order. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a response to, you know, fascism and authoritarian. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to bring up? Well, I think um, I really, what I'm working on an annotated biblio. I just started it. There's some great articles um, in my field on Star Wars already. Um, wow. And some books that I just noted have been released. So I want to kind of put together an annotated bibliography to show, to, for your audience. Like, it's like, oh, I'll give the source and then I'll give a little write-up. Like, if you want to learn more about this, here you go here. Because, you know. I, I can also give a list of basic, like, here's your basic Taoism. Here's your basic Confucianism if you want to know more. Yeah, so, it would be amazing. So I'll put together, you know, two to three page bibliography that people can click through and see if they find something that might pique their interest that might be, you know, a source list available to them. That would be amazing. And I'll I'll post it as a separate kind of religion and Star Wars uh, post, and then I'll link to it in the liner notes so people can find it. Yeah, just a document that, you know, I can provide and... You know, for more resources, see here. That's great. Yeah. And I and I would love to have you back to talk about kind of there's some really interesting um, concepts about divination that have come up and future visions and, you know, that sort of like uh, spirituality of having visions and what that means on the spiritual journey. So flashes of insight or divination of do uh, or or, or I guess getting a flash of doom so you can avoid it. So yeah. divination is definitely something that classic ancient Chinese practice still practice today and definitely influences uh, the worldview. Yeah, I would love I would love to have you back to talk about that, like especially the the idea that 
Um, you can kind of you don't always get what you expect when you have future uh, visions, and sometimes they're almost like self fulfilling prophecies. It seems like with Anakin's visions of Padme and things like that. So I think that would be just super interesting to talk about. Yeah, yeah. No, I would definitely have to look think more about that and uh yeah i'd like to bring in ideas of magical realism and um magical thinking divination yeah 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 okay lots to think about yeah that would be great to talk to you next about (laughs) yeah well i enjoy any opportunity to talk with you so we we really primarily focused on uh, Eastern religions, but there's obviously way more to talk about, which is great. Um, so, Sarah, where can they find you? Well, I actually have a Twitter account at Sarah underscore Gallant, and I'm Sarah with an H, so S A R A H underscore Gallant. So yeah, if- or or you if you live in Washington State, you can come and take our courses. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> community <laughs> college. I I love engaging with students and, you know, talking about these things in person. And I'm going to bug you until you get the anthology of religion and speculative fiction going. I am feeling rather guilty that that hasn't come together (laughs) lately. So, yes, it's on my project list. I will will encourage you as always. (laughs) Well, thank you, Sarah, for being on the show. This has been What the Force... And this has been a discussion on religion in Star Wars and ended up really focusing on Eastern religions, including Taoism, which I think is the closest to what the Force represents in its modern storytelling. But it definitely seems that there's more to talk about. And I love talking about the Force. Um, And so thank you again, Sarah, for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. If if you're looking for us, we're on Twitter at WT4 Show. You can track us down on Facebook, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, uh, really anywhere podcasts are found. And if you feel so inclined, please uh, feel free to leave a review on iTunes or uh, reach out to us on Twitter and start a conversation. 